Um, we're going to actually, we're going to pray before we get into the sermon. So actually, I, I'd like to pray for a few of these things that were offered, and then we're going to get into uh, a message from the Lord. And uh, but keep your fingers right there in Isaiah. Actually, turn to Isaiah chapter 32 is where we're going to start. But so if you want to turn to Isaiah 32, and then we're going to pray. We're going to ask for God's Spirit to move, even right now, in this service. And because I believe that there's a, a spiritual battle that's happening right now, and it's getting very uh, intense, not just here, but around the world. And uh, right now, more than any other time, there are thousands and thousands of people coming to Christ around the world. All over the world, there's revivals that are taking place. And uh, it just seems to be not happening in New England. But it's going to. As we pray and seek the Lord, He's going to bring that here as well. This is where a lot of revivals started, right up here in New England. And it seems like we're going to be the least likely place for God to break out in America. We live there. And what, you know how encouraging it is to live here, uh, in Newport specifically? I just heard that um, Newport is the number one drug town of all New England. Is that wonderful or what? And God brought us here to make a difference. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, you could have been somewhere where it wouldn't have been significant of God doing the work. But look how more significant it's going to be here. I mean, we've already got a reputation. Isn't that great? I mean, other towns don't get that reputation. We've got the number one drug town in New England reputation. Now watch what God wants to do. He, he brought you here to change that. That's encouraging to me. I wanted to go to the darkest place possible to bring the light. I don't know about you. But that's where... And there's, there's a, one of the places I want to go to is called the Maldive Islands, actually. It's 99.9% Muslim. Actually, 100% Muslim. And if you're not a Muslim, you're killed. I want to go there to be a missionary. And that's dark. So New England's not that dark. You know, God's brought you here for a reason. And he wants to use your life. Let's pray that God will work in a mighty way. Let's all open up our hearts to the Lord. Lord, we thank you and praise you. That, Lord, though there is darkness around us, and this world is filled with devils, Lord, you are on the throne, Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are coming back very soon. Your word says, Lord, there's going to be rumblings, there's going to be birth pains that are going to take place in the earth, Lord, before you come back. And Lord Jesus, we just acknowledge right now that it's happening. We, we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you are moving things, Lord, in the heavens, moving things in the earth, Lord. It's like things are starting to part, Lord, for your coming back. Things are making, an opening is being made, Lord. Lord, just as a woman's body is, is changing, Lord, before the baby comes, Lord, the earth is changing, it's, 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 it's developing, it's, it's growing so that you can come back. Lord, you're causing there to be earthquakes. You're causing there to be famines. You're causing there to be wars all over the world, Lord Jesus. And they're all just the beginning, your word says, of birth pains. And Lord, in the end, it says that even us as Christians, Lord, we're going to be persecuted simply because we bear your name, Jesus. We're going to be laughed at. We're going to be scorned for a short time, Lord. And then taken forever and ever to be with you. In paradise, where there is no death, there is no taunting, there is no ridicule. I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I ask for you to bring that revival, Lord, here to New England, that you'd save many people before that time comes, Lord. But I pray that you bring in a mighty harvest, Lord, of Newport, Lord. I'm praying for every single man, every single woman, Lord, to be saved in Jesus' name. I pray you touch every single boy, every single girl, Lord, that you'd use us as a church, Lord, to just be your servants, Lord, and link us with other churches, Lord, who have the same heartbeat that we might be united as churches, that there would never be heard in this church discouragement towards another church that is a Bible-believing church. Lord, I pray you guard our lips from that. That we'd only speak good of other Christians who are born again. Lord, I pray you open our eyes to see that Satan is the one behind that bitterness and that fighting and that conflict. And Lord, I pray you'd save us from it so we might have a mighty harvest of souls, Lord. Many people won to Christ. Lord, I pray that you just work now in this, this dad who's hurt his arm, Lord. And Mary Elizabeth wants us to pray about that. I pray you just work in her and work in this, this dad, Lord. I pray that you bring healing to him in Jesus' name. Lord, there's people in here right now who may be struggling with things, issues that are private. They wouldn't even share it out loud. Lord, I pray you touch them. I pray you open them up right now by your spirit to hear your word spoken. You just use me as your vessel, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand up in respect for God's word. And we're going to read in verse uh, chapter, 20, chapter 32 of Isaiah. So let's stand up. You know, when a king walks in the room, what do you do? 
You bow down, and respectfully you stand, right? Guess what? A king is ruling. And we're reading his word now. This is a king's word. So chapter 32 says right here, See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert in the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Verse 3, And the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed. The ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand. And the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel highly respected. For the fool speaks folly. His mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord. The hungry he leaves empty. From the thirsty he withholds water. The scoundrel's methods are wicked. He makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies. Even when the plea of the needy is just, but the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. Now skip down to verse 11. It says, Tremble, tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your clothes and put sackcloth around your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all the houses of merriment, and for this city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted, the citadel and watchtower will become a wasted wasteland forever, the delight of donkeys, a pastime for the flocks. Verse 15. Till the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the desert becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field becomes like a forest. Justice will dwell in the desert, and righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of righteousness will be peace, the effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, the fruit of righteousness is peace and justice. Lord, I pray you bring a peace upon each person here. That we would seek you and live the righteous life that you want us to. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to share with you a story. Last time I didn't get to finish my sermon. Don't you hate that when you're preaching and you don't get to finish your message? Doesn't that drive you crazy? The nice thing about it is I get to preach next Sunday, so I get to finish it. So I'm just going to finish the last one and then begin the next one. So uh, is, that, is that okay with everybody? Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. There's a woman last time that I was witnessing to, uh, not really witnessing to, talking to her in the Episcopal Church parking lot here in Newport. And she was speaking, if you remember from last Sunday, about the uh, accolades of Gene Robinson who is a gay bishop of the Episcopal Church, and he's openly gay, has a lover, a monogamous, they say. And she told me this, and I didn't get a chance to respond to it. She said he's a very kind and compassionate man. More kind than any other person she'd ever met. She said that, you know what's going to happen? One day, she said, when Jesus comes back and the books are open, this woman says, you're going to find Gene Robinson right at the top of the list of Jesus Christ. Just speaking wonderful things about him. And I'd like to share with you from God's word something. I'd like to turn now with me to 2 Thessalonians. I'd like to answer that question that she raised there. That this man who's living in a homosexual lifestyle, Jesus does love him very much, but he is not kind and he is not compassionate. He may act like he's kind and compassionate on the front. He may show people that, but the, God's word says something completely different than that. And if you, don't, if you don't have God's word, guess what? You'll always fall. You'll always be intimidated by people. You'll, you'll be afraid. You'll be fearful. Because you don't know God's word. And when someone says that, you'll say, well, of course he's nice and kind and compassionate. Oh, well, of course he is. Because you don't want to be looked at as what? Judgmental. Oh, my, don't say that. Judgmental. You're not judgmental, are you? Well, yes, I am. Thank you very much. I'm judgmental about what God's word says. I love sinners. I love people who are lost and going to hell. But if you don't give them God's word, they'll never find joy. They'll never find eternal life. So you have to have it. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 11 says this. The coming of the lawless one, lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, and signs and wonders, 
in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. Listen to what it says here in verse 10. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. That's what happened here. The reason people are perishing is not because there's something wrong in God. There's something wrong in them. They simply said, I do not want to love the truth and be saved. What is the truth? Well, it's a person, isn't it? Jesus Christ. But I'm holding the truth right here. They didn't love the truth, so they'd be saved. And so what happens? Verse 11 says, For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion, so they may believe the lie, and so that all will become condemned, who have not believed the truth and have delighted in wickedness. You see, what Gene Robinson is doing is delighting in wickedness, the Bible says. Because in Romans 1 it says that you're not supposed to engage in immorality with another man. It's wickedness. It's sin. And so it says here that he's delighted in wickedness, and so he's, he's, got, he's been lied to. So I love Gene Robinson. If Gene Robinson would come and say, right in the front, front row right here, i preach the exact same message I'm preaching right now. Because I'm not slandering him. I love him. I, I would love to see him in, in, in a family of God. And I'd show the same message with him. But if you don't love this word, you're going to be deceived. You're going to be deceived. Look at Romans 1 now. Romans 1, verse 21. And this is an answer to the question about Gene Robinson. Is he a kind and compassionate person? Well, let's look what God's word says in Romans 1, verses 21 through 32. It says here that, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, to the degrading of their bodies to one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even the women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. And in the same way, men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed in lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Look at verse 29. They who have done these things, who have involved in these immoralities, they've become filled with every kind of wickedness, it says. Evil and greed and depravity. They are full of envy, full of murder, strife and deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil and they disobey their parents. God's word says that Gene Robinson is claiming to be wise but in reality, is a fool. God's word says that Gene Robinson has not glorified God nor given thanks to him, but instead, he's lived a self-focused life. And the result is that God has given Gene over to the sinful desires of his heart to engage in sexual impurity, which will degrade his body. God's word says that Gene has exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and then God gave Gene over to shameful lust for where he actually started doing things with other men. Because of this, Gene is not compassionate. He's filled with every kind of wickedness. He's filled with evil. He's filled with greed and depravity. He's full of envy and murder and strife, deceit and malice. He's a gossip. The Bible says this. He's a slanderer, a God-hater, insolent and arrogant and boastful, and he invents ways of doing evil. And I like the last line. He disobeys his parents. If that weren't all of it, he disobeys his parents on top of it. So don't let anybody intimidate you and say, oh, this homosexual person is very nice and kind. How could you not love him? It's all a game. You ever been a school teacher? The kid you want to watch out for the most is the one who looks good on the outside. Because the teacher's gone. He's the one inside and rise against you. And that's exactly what Satan's doing. It's deceptive. i got to share this. One of Adolf Hitler's henchmen was a homosexual. You know what he said? He said, I don't want any heterosexual men in my group because they're pansies, basically, he said. They're wimps. 
the homosexual man is not concerned with the feminine sex and the, the lighter things. They're much more hardened and they can inflict much more pain on people more ruthlessly. They were intimidating people. That's how Hitler got power, was by intimidating people. And the ones who could intimidate the best were homosexuals, he said. Don't let anybody tell you they're kind and compassionate. They're abusers of people. You know, the average homosexual has a partner in two years. You know how many partners he has in two years? Twelve. And when he gets tired of men, he goes to boys. Not saying that heterosexual people don't do that too. But there's something very evil about it because of what God's word says here. We should pray for them. We should love them. We're not going to have pickets and bomb things and do those kind of things, but we should know God's word and not be afraid to stand on it. Not be intimidated because they say, oh, they're so much kinder than everybody else. They're not. They're not. You know, Hitler, when he first came to power, everybody hated him, right? No. When Adolf Hitler came to power, they said, here's our savior. Here's our savior. He's the kindest, compassionate person. He brought us out of welfare. He brought us out of all these problems. He's a wonderful man. How could you not love Adolf Hitler? And then at the end of his life, you know what Adolf Hitler wanted to do? As all of his people were down in the sewers of Germany, down in the, the, under the ground because they're being bombed by the Allies, you know what Hitler wanted to do to all those people? Flood them and drown them all. The ones that he rescued, the ones that he loved so much, you know, the heart of Satan is to destroy. And I'll use the bait of sexual morality, but his end goal for you is destruction. In Newport, one of the strongest things we have is sexual morality that's just ravaging this town. If you've lived in this town long enough, you know it. People have no regard for God anymore. And they're going instead to sexual impurity. Pornography is ramp- rampant. There's a new one that just opened up. Pornography store right next to uh, the laundromat. They already have two different video stores who sell pornographic videos. I walked in to talk to one of them, and I can tell you who, and I said, um, I had a folks in the family pamphlet, and I said, you know, pornography really increases women to be abused. Did you know that? He said, oh, it does not. I've watched every single one of them. There's no women being abused in them. <laughs> See, when you believe a lie, what happens to your mind? You know, it's gone. <laughs> Satan comes in there and just has fun with you. No, it's been, it's been side of all things. The worst place for a woman to walk at night is next to a strip bar. <laughs> because there should be rape. And all day long they're watching this woman saying, you can have me, you can have me. And then they walk out and say, well, let's just grab something that walks by. It's sin, isn't it? And it's bringing many people into destruction in, in this town of Newport. And when is the church going to mourn, mourn and weep over it? I asked God my, my, my same thing. Brian, you live, we've learned as a church to live with morality, haven't we? We kind of just brush it off, you know? Yeah, the church is, you know, living in a cesspool, it seems like, you know? Instead of saying, what is it God's calling me to do? He's calling me to weep over the children who are being abused. Amen. He's called me to weep over the women who are being abused. He's called me to weep over the men who are being taken as a lie in homosexuality. In Newport, I saw this guy. He's a look, last looking kind of person. I was, I, was, I was over at Hope Fellowship at the church and this guy lived across the street in their apartment there. He doesn't live there anymore so I'm telling you about it, okay? He's gone. This young man was 18 years old. Five people had asked him to, con- to engage in homosexual events. Five people in Newport. You would never look at that guy and say, man, he's struggling with homosexuality. He looked like a heavy metal kind of guy, you know, Holly Davidson kind of guy. 18 years old. And we as a church are kind of just going, let's pick some daisies. Do, 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 do. Oh, the music's so nice. Do, 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 do. Oh, don't you love everybody? Oh, I do. do, 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 do. <laughs> and Satan's saying, yeah, keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. Don't look around. Don't look at everybody else that's falling around you. And all of a sudden the church is going, hey, how come you guys are all laying down? Because we got wiped out while you were picking daisies. <laughs> That's why. And God says, wake up as a church and to mourn and to weep. And I wonder, that was my sermon from last time. So let's just close there and, and uh, 
start the new sermon now. So that was last sermon. So Gene Robinson is not a very kind and compassionate person, and I wanted, and I love him very much, and I love to see him come into to salvation. But don't believe the lies, okay? Listen to God's word. All right. So now I, I talk to another woman this week, and she's taking my blood. This is the new sermon, okay? So stop that one. Go on to this one. All right. And uh, this woman was taking my blood. I'm not going to tell you who her name is, but but I was getting a. Uh, it came into my house because I, I got some life insurance. Sometimes when you get life insurance, they have to check you, make sure you don't have all these diseases and things so you don't die, and you give them money. So I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to die real soon. So I took my blood and stuff, and uh, as she was talking with me, I said, what a wonderful opportunity to tell her about the blood of Jesus. Yeah, she's taking my blood. Why don't I tell, tell her about the life-giving blood? And so I just said, um, I said, you started off with sin. That's what I usually do. And I said, have you ever, um, I said, do you have any spiritual beliefs first? And she says, I'm a Catholic. And I said, I know, but what spiritual beliefs do you have? She goes, well, I'm Catholic. And I said, oh. I said, do you believe in heaven and hell? And she goes, oh, yes, I do. And I said, do you believe in that you're a sinner? She goes, no. I I thought you said you're Catholic. Well, I don't believe that part of it. I don't believe I, I said, let's explore this a little bit further. I said, have you ever sinned before? I mean, even once? And she goes, no. This is the first time, really, in my entire time of sharing the gospel that I've experienced a woman or a man who said, I've never sinned. And so I, I thought I had to explore this and peel it back a little more. I said, you ever told a lie once? She goes, no. <laughs> she probably just did. But I, I didn't say that to her. You know, I just met her, so I just didn't want to be too rude. So I just said, uh, you ever, like, slandered somebody behind their back, gossiped? She goes, no, I don't do that. And I said, all right, you ever um, uh, just been uh, angry towards somebody? No, I've never been angry at anybody. I said, you, you ever done something? You ever done something you shouldn't have done? Anything? She goes, no. Well, one time I smoked a cigarette. And I said, but it was okay. My uncle gave it to me and I was 12. I said, so that wasn't wrong? No, because he gave it to me. I said, all right, okay. Um, so she's just a perfect woman. Nothing wrong with her. You know what the Bible would say about that woman? She's like, if I look further on, she felt that religion was created by man. Okay, she's a good Catholic, remember? And I was starting to uh, spiral. She's not a good Catholic anymore. She's kind of out there. She's saying, God, God is, she said, who created religion? She asked me that question. She said, who created, let me ask you a question. Who, who created religion? And I said, well, I don't really believe in religion. I believe in Jesus. <coughs> she goes, well, who created all that stuff, religion? And, and I said, well, what, are you, what do you think? And she says, well, I think people just created it to control the masses. And, and, and God is just there when you need him. Like I was in an accident once, I needed God, so I prayed. To this person you created? Yeah, this person, no. I didn't say that. But <laughs> yeah, pray, pray to him, and then I got out of the jam. And I don't need God anymore. People have these weird ideas. When you start talking to them, share the gospel. It's so much fun. It really is. Because you can see what Satan's doing in their minds. Nothing makes sense. It's just kind of all spattered around here. But if we don't share the gospel with them, they're never going to hear it. And so I said to her, so, here, let me get this right. I said, you believe that God's there when you need him, but when you don't need him, you can do pretty much whatever you want. She says, yes. And I said, well, I didn't say this to her, but let me tell you what the Bible would call this person. Complacent. You know what complacent means? Complacent means self-satisfied and smug. Self-satisfied and smug. She's self-satisfied. I don't need God. I just need him when I need a problem. I need God. But otherwise, I don't need him. Well, look at Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32, we're going to answer this question. How are we awakened? How do people become awakened? And I want to share with you what God's Word says in Isaiah 32. Look at verse 9. It says, You women who are complacent, Isaiah 32, verse 9, You women who are complacent, rise up and listen to me. These women in Israel here, were, in Jerusalem, were very complacent. They weren't afraid, they, they weren't nervous about anything. They were pretty much complacent. They did whatever they wanted, basically. You ever met women like that? Mm-hmm. You ever met men like that? Mm-hmm. I'll do whatever I want. No one tell me what I'm going to do. Get in my face. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to punch you. That's how I'm going to solve this problem. It's going to be my fist in your face. That's going to solve that problem. That's called self-satisfied called smug. It's called complacent. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. How do you help somebody like that? 
Well, here's what Isaiah did. When God spoke to him, he said to this in verse 11, Tremble! What, you know what a complacent person needs? Trembling. And then he says another thing, Mourn! What For what? For all the houses of merriment. For this city of revelry. You see, what happened in Jerusalem was they were, they were so, so complacent, they weren't thinking about anything. I, Assyria had come in and had, had captured all these different lands around them and they were still complacent. They're, sitting, they're living, going from party to party. They weren't looking to God. I mean, here they are a nation called out, called God, basically. Israel, called of God. You know, set apart. That's their name, even. And they're looking for themselves. They've met people like that who run from party to party. Can't wait to the weekend. Can't wait to the weekend. Get a party and I'm going to forget everything I ever did. They're living for it. It's called revelry. And that's what these women were doing. And, and here God says to mourn for them. Why? Because they're going to be destroyed. You know what somebody like this woman needed? She needed to be woken up that God is coming back. Jesus Christ comes back. You know what? It was interesting. When I talked to this woman, she was taking my blood. By the way, you probably didn't want to show the gospel when taking your blood because they have a needle and it's really scary. But she was so nice to me. Uh, She's actually very good. I, reckon, I don't know if I can tell you her name, but she was very good about it. She took two vials of blood. I didn't even notice it. It was really good. And, um, but anyway, uh, what am I talking about that for? Uh, she was, she, this little ADD problem right there. Just, come back now. All right. Um, so I, I'm talking with her, and I said, you know what? Jesus Christ is coming back. Did you know that? Jesus is coming back. And she goes, oh, no. He died. He's dead. And I said, no, but the Bible says he, he rose from the dead. And he's coming back. And you know where he's coming back? He's coming back to judge sin. And those who are living in sin. What was I trying to do in her? Cause a little trembling. That's how she's going to be awoken. If you can't confront sin, you're never going to cause someone to tremble and they're never coming to God. They may just, you know, add God onto their lifestyle, but they're not saved. They're not saved. She needed to tremble about her sin. But she didn't want to tremble about her sin. She said, religion just makes people angry. Listen, religion just makes people afraid. She said, I don't want to make people afraid. And I said, if your kid was on the highway and a semi was coming, would you want him to feel a little bit of fear? She said, well, that's a different story. We're not talking about highways. I said, that's what's, that's what's happening here. I said, God is coming back. He's like a locomotive, okay? He's bringing judgment when he comes. He's not going to bring like roses and pass them out. Everybody thinks, you know, here's the moonies. You know, here's, here, here's Jesus is going to pass out roses to you. No, he's going to hit you. He's going to knock you out. It's going to be over. Ever heard that song? I'm going to knock you out. Brother says, I'm going to knock you out. That was a good song. I like little rap music. That was, man. I live in Chicago. But that was a good song. God says, I'm going to knock you out. You're out, man. I'm taking you out. Because why? You're living in sin. And you can't stand against me. And she did not want to face that. She wanted to hide from it. And so she said, oh, don't be silly. She said, I don't have to listen to you. I said, you don't have to listen to me, but you have to listen to God's word. Either now or later, you have to listen to God's word. Well, here's the problem is, look at verse 17. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. Did you know that? The fruit of righteousness will be peace. Are we experiencing peace in Newport? Anybody want to answer that? See, our goal in Newport, and probably Claremont too, is I, I went to one of the graduation ceremonies. How many have been graduated before? Okay. All right, great. So you know what it's like. If you get up there in a Newport, you know what they say in Newport? I heard it. I heard it. They say, you know what we value? I said, what? We value community. You heard that in the graduation ceremony? This person is very community focused. They help the community. You know, here's a community award for them. You know what community speaks to? Everybody getting along. Everybody liking each other. Is that reality here? No. no. See, what happened was, we said, God, leave our schools. And actually, in the Newberry school system, what's it called down there? Somebody say. Click here, Sarge. I don't know if it's happened in Newport, but they said the Pledge of Allegiance now is our God. One nation, indivisible. What's it supposed to be? One nation under God, indivisible. They say, one nation, indivisible. You can't divide us. Why? Because we're all into ecumenicalism. We're all into bringing every religion under one boat. And God kind of ruins that. You know, it's like, 
kind of bothers us, God does. So let's get them out of there. Let's just throw them out. And then what happens is, you get, no one can learn how to forgive without God. Why would you forgive somebody else unless Jesus Christ forgave you? I told that somebody when I was witnessing to them. I said, you know what? When you become a Christian, guess what you have to do? You've got to forgive everybody who's hurt you. What are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> you got to forgive everybody that hurts you. Otherwise, you aren't a Christian. You're a liar. If you have bitterness in your heart right now, guess what? The, the train comes, it's going to knock you out. I'm not going to take you home. It's going to knock you out. Because you have bitterness in your heart. Jesus says, if you not forgive other people, I'm not going to do forgive you. I don't care if you said a prayer when you're five years old. I don't care if you said a prayer when you're 25 years old. You're living in bitterness. You're not going to forgive. The worst ones, the hardest ones to forgive are the Christians, aren't they? They should know better. Right? They should know better. So we're going to harbor some bitterness against them, right? Jesus says, uh-uh. you got to forgive even those who are Christians. who claim the name of Christ. Even if they should know better. And guess what? God's word says here, the only way to get peace in the world is through his word. Uh, I, some of you know that I, I'm a flatlander. You can probably tell by my accent. I'm not really from here. Sorry. But um, I like it here. Um, but uh, there's more mountains here and hills than in Iowa. That's for sure. <clears throat> but we have to feel the dreams, man. Feel the dreams. Huh? Come on. Bring them on. That's all we got. That's the biggest tourist attraction in Iowa is go to a cornfield and watch nothing. <laughs> Look, it's a baseball field. If you go, they're going to come. Just imagine it. They're coming. Come on. They're coming out of the, the corn. You know? And um, anyways, uh, man, what is this ADD today? I don't know. Whether, okay. Uh, um, so anyway, this guy came to, to Des Moines, Iowa. He's a doctor. His name is John Patrick. And John Patrick was a doctor from England, actually. And he lived in Canada. He was very smart, a uh, very wise person, and he was a Christian, actually. And he was speaking at the University of Iowa to some medical students. And he came to my home church, which was in, which was in Des Moines, Iowa. And I'll never forget the message he shared there. It was about three or four years ago that he was there. My mom sent me the tape. Because she still goes to that church. And uh, here's what he said. He said, what I, will do, what I do as a, as a um, doctor is I specialize in famine relief. He goes into Africa and to places where there's famine and tries to bring a sense of uh, understanding of how to harvest the food and how to you know, distribute it to people. And one of these times he said, I was over there in Africa in one of these communities and he looked around and saw babies bloated with their stomachs starving and men and women dying because they didn't have any food. And he looked around the community and they had every single resource they needed to feed everybody there. It was all right around them. So he said, well, here's the problem. It's education. They've not been educated. So if I educate them, then they'll be able to feed themselves. So that's what he's set to do. His whole family goes over there on summer breaks because he's now a teacher. And so his summer break is to go to Africa. And they get little chickens. When they help, they help somebody get better, they give them a chicken. So at the end of their time, they have like a whole flock of chickens, you know, because they're helping people who are starving. And so this doctor got together all the community leaders and he taught them how to harvest the, the, the crops how to plant the crop, how to make sure that the insects don't get too much, all that kind of stuff, and then how to store them, and then how to distribute them. They all understood it. And he watched them do it. And he went away. Came back a year later, the same problem. My kids are starving, men and women are dying. He said, what? Okay, I'm going to try to teach them again. He said, maybe they're not well educated. Maybe if they're well educated, they'll have, be able to solve this problem. So he educated them again. Came back a year later, same exact uh, starvation rate in that community. He taught them. He educated them. And then God, I believe, spoke to him and said, teach them Deuteronomy. Teach them the book of Deuteronomy. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, guess what's found there? All you kids should know this. Ten Commandments. Honor your parents. You know? I really, I, Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5. Turn it with me, actually. Read. Deuteronomy 5. Exodus 2 has it as well. You're right. Okay, Deuteronomy 5. He taught them God's Word. The question I want to ask is, what's the answer? How are you going to bring justice? How are you going to bring peace? Well, 
What does it say? You can read this yourself, but I'm going to just read the Ten Commandments to you. Here's what they are. You're not supposed to have any other gods before you. You're not supposed to have any idols before the Lord. The third one is to not blaspheme God. The fourth one is to keep the Sabbath holy, not even working on that day. The fifth one is to honor your mother and your father. The sixth one is to not murder. And Jesus said, don't even be angry at somebody. It's the same thing as murder. The seventh one is to not commit adultery. Not to live in a relationship with somebody outside of marriage as well. The eighth one is to not steal. The ninth one is to not lie against your neighbor. It means don't speak badly around those, about, about those around you, especially as a Christian. And here's what I like. Sometimes we as Christians say, oh, they're Baptists. We don't like them. Oh, they're Charismatics. We don't like them. Oh, they speak in tongues. We don't like them. Oh, they don't speak in tongues. We don't like them. Oh, they read the King James Version. We don't like them. Oh, they don't read the King James Version. We don't like them. Oh, they just lied to me. They didn't make me feel the way I wanted to be feel, felt. So I don't like them. That's breaking the ninth commandment to not lie against your neighbor, to not speak badly about them. You know what the problem in the church today is? We think we are by ourselves have the answer. We got it. Yep. I went to one, when I was in the charismatic church, I went to one church and it was the, uh, they said, all the people who are Baptists and all those people who don't have the gifts of the Spirit are going to be swept away by God's judgment. And the only ones who are going to be left are those who speak in tongues. That's what they said. So everybody in there is speaking in tongues going, Yeah! Get them, God! Get them! <laughs> Why? Because they don't speak in tongues. <sighs> they judged me once. I remember it. And now those, the Baptist church where I went to Moody Bible Institute, in which they are cessationists, they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit and all that kind of stuff. If you look at our mission statement, our faith statement, I don't believe that anymore. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But um, when I was at Moody, they read books like Charismatic Confusion. When you read that, it's like the Charismatics are of the devil. They're demonically possessed. The tongues are really not from the Lord. They're from demons. Don't love them. Hate them. Shun them. <laughs> Run from them. Hide them. And uh, so you've got two camps here. And you feel really good when you're inside those camps, don't you? Oh, you feel safe. You, you sing kumbaya and you throw rocks at the other person. <laughs> and God looks down and says, um, you're supposed to love each other, right? I died so that you wouldn't talk badly about other people, but that you'd love each other. Right? Anybody say amen to that? Amen. This girl who spoke at Congress, her name is Ruth Royval, and she was down in Cali, Columbia. And uh, to make a long story short, they saw revival take through there in such a mighty way. They decided in one weekend that they would devote it towards sharing the gospel. All the churches there, or at least a, a quarter of the churches, and they found 72,000 people get saved in one weekend. 72,000 people. You want to know why, she said? Because we uh, get along with people who are cons- conservatives, and the, and the conservatives get along with the, the charismatics. And we all love each other. 400 pastors in the city get together and they pray for each other. You know, one, one idea they had about reaching the city was to, to anoint the city with oil. They are going to get up in a helicopter and anoint the whole city with oil. And all the conservative, uh, you know, Bible church background people said, okay, God bless you. We're going to stay right here. And all the charismatics said, that's the answer. That's the answer. There's not enough oil over them. If you got oil over everybody, they, you know, that's what the spirit would work. And so they said, okay, go, God bless you. Get up in the helicopter and do it. They didn't speak bad about them doing it. And the charismatic trip in the helicopter didn't speak bad about the Baptists down there watching them. They just didn't do it. They said, we're going to love each other no matter what. And that's what the world's looking for. You know that? That's what God's looking for. When will revival take place? When the churches get along with each other. When pastors no longer backbite. They love each other no matter what. As long as they're born again. You know, they're saved. That's the key. Jesus, did he forgive your sins? Yes, I love you. Did Jesus forgive your sins yet? No, I love you. Who do you love? Everybody. It's simple. Who do you hate? Nobody. It's simple, isn't it? The Christian life's real simple. Satan makes it confusing. But anyways, uh, let's go back over to this. Uh, in Deuter- so he's back in Africa. The last one is not cover anything. To not cover your neighbor's wife, that's important. To not cover your neighbor's house or their jet ski, or their snowmobile. 
not covet any of those things, or their horse. It's not covet. Okay, and so Deuteronomy 10, 14 through 18, look what it says here. It says, To the Lord your God belongs the heaven and the highest heaven, the earth and everything in it. If the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, he chose you, their descendants above all nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore. Do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and a Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the alien, giving food and clothing. See, the problem in Africa is because they didn't know God's word. All the resources were right there for them to feed him. But they looked at verse 18, and it says, God loves the fatherless and the widow, and he gives food and clothing to those who are in need. You know why they weren't having food in Africa? Because what they do is they would accept bribes. All those in, in, in the leadership positions in the towns would accept bribes or just give it to their friends or just give it to the wealthy, and they would get the food, and all the poor people would be starving to death. The ones who didn't have any influence. There's no justice because there's no God's word. And once they had God's word, then they feared God. And they said, whew, if God's going to judge us based on how we're living, I'm going to give food to the needy. I'm going to give food to that person. And so the answer was Deuteronomy, not education. America is based on this model. Teach them, and they'll become smarter, and they'll become a better nation. But since 1963, we took prayer to school. And this nation was founded upon God's word. And since that time, what do we have? We have neglected children now today. We have abortion on demand today. We have people who hate each other today. We have fear. There's so many people who are so anxious and so depressed that the drugs industry is going crazy for Prozac and Zoloft and all these companies. They're making mega million dollars. Because why? Because people aren't being taught God's word and they're being taught to run to something to fix their problem. God says, I'll fix your problem if you come to me. There's some issues that are medically treated. And I'm not saying all issues are that way. But why, why weren't they around so much in the 1950s? Why, why was there not this, this case of all these depressions and, and all these suicides back then? Because people were reading God's Word then. People were teaching God's Word then. You see, today we're living in a famine land, aren't we? In America. Well, anyway, to close this sermon, I, let's go back to that woman taking my blood. I shared a third about the blood of Jesus. I said in Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned. I know you say you're not a sinner, but all have sinned. And they come, they've fallen short of the glory of God. So I said, whether you believe it or not, whether you believe that you need God or not, you do need Him. Whether you believe it or not, you need Him. And you depend on Him right now. Well, how about you? Are you living in the light of God's soon return? Or do you maybe like this woman feel like God's not going to return? You know how I could tell? I could watch your life. I could look in your pocketbook. I could watch how you spend your money. And I'd know that you're living like Jesus is coming back. You're living for yourself. You spend all your money on yourself. You don't give it to anybody else. I could ask how much time you spend in God's Word. And I could know if you're looking forward to Jesus coming back. But how much time you spend in God's Word. We'd rather read God's Word ten minutes and watch ten movies. He says, you're looking forward to my return? There's ten virgins. One was five were wise and five were foolish. Jesus told the parable, the five foolish ones did what? Slept. The five wise ones did what? They were alert, watching. How do you watch as a Christian? By obeying God's word. If you're not obeying God's word, you're not watching for Jesus' return. You're living for yourself. If you have no room for God's word in your life, you're living for yourself. Jesus Christ is coming back. Not for you to live for yourself. For you to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. When Jesus comes back and says, well done, what's he going to say well done to you about? What have you done for him? <coughs> what's he going to say well done to you about? Well, I went to church and I heard a crazy guy with an ADD. No. That wasn't it. I don't want an ADD. I'm just faking it. I'm just kidding. I, don't, I really don't have it. But I don't. <laughs> Come on. But, um... When God comes back, He's going to seriously look at your life. He's going to pry open all the areas. Would you want, if I could point to somebody right now, I'm not going to point to anybody because I don't want to embarrass anybody. I really do, but I'm not going to do it. I'm holding myself back. But if I had to point somebody in here, 
and say, okay, Frank, if we open up your life and saw how much you're reading God's Word, what would people see? What would people see, Frank? How much time are you reading God's Word this week? Uh, uh, I think I prayed once. Oh, I read, I read a devotion. Yes, I read a devotional once. You see, Jesus Christ is coming back and we live like he's not. We judge the woman who has taken my blood and say, she doesn't even think God's coming back. We know she, we know he is. Yeah, but you're not even living for him. You're, it's even wor- you're even worse case than she is because she knows she doesn't believe he's coming back and so she's living for herself. But you believe he's coming back and you're still living for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and when we as a church can wake up and take the rebuke and follow instead of saying, that pastor's me. If you follow that and, and take it into your heart and say, God, I want to follow you. I'm going to run after you. I'm going to pray every morning. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to follow God's word. I'm not going to say, wow, I had to read 20 chapters this week. I'm going to say, is that all? Is that all I have to read? I, I convict myself too. I want to run towards movies. You know that? I want to watch something. I want to be entertained. It's my weakness. God woke me up the other day, 4 o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much, God. <laughs> he said this, Brian, these words to me. Do you love me? <laughs> yes, I'm awake now. Yes, I love you. Will you get up and pray? <sighs> the pillow is so soft. The covers are so warm. I said, yes, I love you, God. Got out of bed and prayed. God is speaking to you as well. Do you love me? Prove it. Prove it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak in the people's hearts. Lord, that you'd you wake us up as Christians, Lord. So we seek you more than ourselves. So when we get to heaven, we wouldn't say, look at all the things we accomplished for ourselves. We would say, look at all the things I accomplished for God's kingdom. Look at all the things that I built for him. Look at how I gave my money to the, to the poor, to the needy, and to those who had needs. Instead of storing up for a, another brick, or another piece of wood, or another piece of hay, another piece of, piece of stubble that's going to be blown away. Lord, I pray that we would have fruit that lasts for eternity. We'd give to those who are needy. We'd spend time in your presence, Lord. Please wake us up as Christians, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to uh, close this one song here. It's called Create Me a Clean Heart by Keith Green. This guy really impacted my life a lot. He was a, a singer. He was a hippie. And he gave his life to Jesus. And you know what his goal in life was? I've said it before, but I'll just keep saying it. To make everybody jealous of his walk with God. That's how he lived his life. I want everybody to be jealous of my walk with God. It'd be a good goal for each one of us. Let's sing this to Lord. Let's stand up. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me.
I just pray that you touch each person's heart here. Lord, I pray that we would uh, come to you with clean hands, Lord. Lord, you say that the remedy that the world has is to come before you, Jesus, and to ask you to take away our sins. Your blood has been shed, Jesus Christ, to wipe away our sins, to cleanse us, to redeem us, to be called sons and daughters. Lord Jesus, you're coming back very soon. Lord, I pray that you'd be found waiting and ready for you like those five virgins with their, their trim uh, wicks, Lord. I pray you give us those wicks that are trimmed, Lord, watching, and that we have oil in our lamps, Lord, the oil of faithfulness to you, the oil of seeking you, the oil of watching for you, Jesus Christ. We want to be your followers, Lord, that the world looks at us and says, boy, that person loves Jesus. Lord, I pray you do that work in each person here, that you take away any attack of the enemy right now who would want to steal the word. As soon as people walk out of here, Lord, I pray your word would be upon us so powerfully. We couldn't be distracted from it. We run into your presence, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give something to each person. If I could have Gene come up here and I want to pass out. You ever gone to the doctor and got a prescription? I want to give you a prescription from Jesus today. All right? Jesus even signed it. It looks like my signature, but it's not. It's Jesus'. And Jesus signed it. And I want you to, to see. This is, what, this is what the key is to, to Gene. Let's pass him out. This is what the key is for how do you know you're going to go to heaven? Here's the prescription for how you know you're going to go to heaven. So I want you to pass this out. Each person get one before you leave. Now let's read it to you. It's from God's Word. Revelation 22, 14 and 15. You know what it says? Blessed are those who wash their robes they might have the right to the tree of life. Blessed are those who what? Pray to receive Christ and live like the world. Is that what it said? No. He said, blessed are those who wash their robes that they might have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves the practice of falsehood. This is this, the ticket to heaven right here. You want it? Right there it is. Just wash your hands and say, Jesus, I want you. I'm going to live for you. Amen. And go away rejoicing and praising the Lord. All right. Let's Huh? I'll pick you up. Yeah, I'll pick you up. Yeah, I'll pick you up.